Shinto shrines are believed to host spirits called kami. Shrines are found throughout Japan, and praying at them is part of the fabric of everyday life. Priests look after shrines and perform various Shinto rites. By doing so, they make an important contribution to preserving and passing on aspects of Japanese culture that date back thousands of years. This time on Japanology Plus, we look at the duties of priests at Shinto shrines. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. In Japan, people go to Shinto shrines to pray, to celebrate the new year, to take part in festivals, sometimes to get married. Shrines are an integral part of daily life in Japan. A shrine in Japan is invariably associated with the country's indigenous religion, Shinto. It's also a place where Shinto priests go to work. When you go to a shrine, you'll see priests walking around the grounds in their traditional outfits. But I've never been totally sure what it is they do. So here we are, and hopefully we'll find out. The number of shrines in Japan today is estimated at over 80,000. And the number of priests is about 22,000. Shinto priests guard the enshrined kami respond to the needs of shrine visitors and perform sacred everyday tasks in accordance with ancient forms. A key aspect of a priest's work is mediating between kami and people. Since ancient times, the Japanese have seen spirits in such manifestations of nature as the sun, sea and mountains. These spirits were thought to have the power to bring good fortune or calamity. The deep respect this power engendered evolved into Shinto, Japan's spiritual tradition. Because the countless phenomena interpreted as kami are all natural, Shinto has no icons and no precepts. Prayers for peace, good harvests, and protection from disaster and disease have always been addressed to invisible spirits. Shrines as we know them today have existed for over 1,200 years. The object in which the kami is believed to dwell is called goshintai. This is treated with the utmost respect. A shrine priest's responsibilities include appropriate care of the goshintai. The duties of a shrine priest were formally defined about 800 years ago. The relevant regulations were issued by the Kamakura Shogunate, which ruled Japan at the time. Article 1 specifies the proper conduct of a shrine priest. Respect for the kami is a path to great benefits. A well-maintained shrine and thriving festivals are extremely important because they bring people contentment. By observing these guidelines, priests have nurtured traditions that define not just shrines, but society itself. Good morning, Fujimoto-san. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Nice to meet you. Yorio Fujimoto is an associate professor who teaches at a university known for its Shinto studies program. He is also a shrine priest himself. He speaks and writes on the history of Shinto, shrines, and the role of shrine priests. To understand shrines and Shinto priests, Fujimoto believes that first, you need to be aware of contemporary views of Shinto in Japan. 
everywhere you go in Japan, you're always going to see a Shinto shrine. Some of them are large and opulent, like this one. And very often, you'll see somebody walking through the grounds, and they'll always bow towards the shrine. I've always wondered what it is that they're thinking of when they're doing that. For the people of Japan, Shinto is about showing deep respect for natural phenomena that inspire awe in humans, mountains, rivers, the sea, and so on. Putting our hands together and bowing is an ancient gesture of reverence. There's a document from a few centuries ago that defines a kami as anything, good or bad, that transcends human understanding and power. Some kami were originally human beings. What they did on behalf of others was of great note. They accomplished outstanding things. Such individuals may also become the object of prayer. Well, that's interesting because um, the monotheistic god in the West is translated into Japanese as kamisama, mm. which is the word that you've used for something meaning with a totally different meaning. Mm. And it can get rather misleading. So I think people need to understand mm -hmm. that when you say kamisama in Japanese, we're not talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the monotheistic mm -hmm. god at all. Let's say some great scholar became a kami, and people now pray to that kami or kamisama. There are people who will pray for things other than academic success. They'll pray for family stability or recovery from illness. That's one interesting aspect of the Japanese attitude towards kami. Some pray selectively, while others feel that any kami is appropriate for all kinds of prayers. Generally, when you talk about religion in the West, there are a whole lot of rules that come with it. You, know, you must do this, you must not do this. From my own observation, Shinto seems to have none of that at all. There are certainly far fewer strict rules than in other religions. In Buddhism, for example, to become a priest, you must leave everyday life behind. You cut ties with the mundane world. You shave your head, and your everyday clothing is traditional. Shinto priests do wear special outfits at the shrine, but you don't see the same separation from the secular world. They can wear regular clothes, just like I am now. Remember, I am a credentialed shrine priest, but I can wear this suit. Shinto priests are considered intermediaries between the kami and humans. So when appearing before the kami, a priest must follow liturgical rules. But other than that, there aren't many rules and regulations. Actually, there are very few indeed. What are the specific duties performed by a shrine priest? Let's see a few of them. One ritual that shrine priests are frequently requested to perform is purification. People seek to be cleansed of sin, impurity or misfortune. This is especially important in pivotal years in life or when a person is going through a tough time. The priest waves this sacred item to drive away the badness. The priest waves the object left, right and left again over the person or thing being purified. This is believed to sweep away the bad. This distinctive chant is the format used to pray to the enshrined kami. The words include esoteric Japanese that even native speakers find hard to understand, but which shrine priests must master. Shrine priests perform many traditional rituals. This one is for children. Healthy development is celebrated, and a prayer is offered for future freedom from disease and misfortune. The ritual is for boys of five and for girls of three and seven. For this 753 ritual, the children wear formal outfits and visit the shrine on November 15th.
A groundbreaking ceremony is often held on building sites. A Shinto priest prays for problem-free construction, the well-being of the occupants, and the long-term success of the building. This is one of the few rituals that is performed away from the shrine. Shinto priests also perform weddings at shrines. The style of shrine weddings that took shape about 100 years ago has recently come back into fashion. As well as marking key moments in life, priests perform rites that commemorate the changing seasons. The busiest of these observances is at the new year. People make their first shrine visit of the new year to offer thanks for the previous year and to pray for a smooth year to come. It is said that the most popular shrines receive more than three million visitors in the first three days of the new year. Another role for a priest is the administration of festivals, the most important events in the shrine's calendar. At heart, a festival is an expression of thanks to the local kami for watching over people's daily lives. It's like a party thrown in honor of the kami, as well as a prayer for community peace, progress, and prosperity. Some festivals are huge undertakings. Let's look at one that has been observed for 1,300 years. It's a ceremonial rehousing of the shrine's kami. It is believed that over time, the shrine building accumulates impurity. Every 20 years, a new shrine is built and the kami is relocated. Since an entirely new shrine must be built from the ground up, preparations for the move start eight years in advance. The most crucial task of all is transferring the kami. This is undertaken with great care by about 120 shrine priests. As shrine priests perform these traditional tasks, they also preserve Japanese culture through the generations. Do priests generally live on the premises? A lot of shrines have no permanent priest on the premises. That's because one priest may be in charge of a number of shrines. Niigata has more shrines than any other prefecture. And there, one priest may be in charge of 10 to 20 shrines. Wow. Away from the big urban centers, out in regional Japan, that's a very common state of affairs. There are only 11,000 or so guji, or head priests. There are far more shrines than head priests, so that's the only solution. So it's a very busy job. Yes. Outside the big cities in rural Japan, you'll find examples of priests performing purification rituals just about every day in one of the shrines for which they are responsible. Those priests are very busy. You mentioned that out in the countryside, maybe one priest would be responsible for seven or eight or even more shrines. When that happens, does your salary go up commensurate with the number of shrines you're responsible for? Well, fewer people visit the shrines in smaller communities, so the shrines don't get so much income. Many priests are unable to make a living solely from shrine work. Oh, really? Some people actually have to take on another job as well. A job in local government or running a car maintenance workshop. I know of people who are actually doing those jobs and also serving as priests. Take my father, for example. He couldn't get by on shrine work alone, so he also worked as a traditional shrine carpenter. It's hard to say which was his primary job. I watched him handling festivals and doing groundbreaking rituals and so on from when I was little. But I think I actually have more memories of him doing carpentry work. As for which made up more of his income, I think it was carpentry. 
I'd say dual careers are the rule rather than the exception among Shinto priests in the countryside. Hi, I'm Matt Alt, and this is Plus One. On today's episode, I've come to a Shinto shrine in the heart of downtown Tokyo. Now, if you've ever been to a Shinto shrine, you might have noticed the Miko, shrine maidens dressed in traditional red and white ceremonial garb. They're certainly one of the more charming aspects of a Shinto shrine, but what exactly sort of work do they do? That's what we're gonna find out on today's episode. Well, there's a shrine maiden now. Hello there. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I love your outfit. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I've always wanted to ask, what exactly do Miko do at a shrine? We sweep the grounds in the shrine precinct. We guide visitors around. We sell good luck charms. We handle quite a variety of tasks. responsibility for Miko is to assist shrine priests in performing purifications and other rituals. That signals the start of the ceremony. She gives the visitor a sacred bow to use in making her prayer to the kami. It is a physical embodiment of the prayer, and that will be presented as an offering. There are various rules for how to present it. The Miko offers support and guidance. I can see the Miko help with giving the guidance. Yes. And what is this? It's a cup of sacred sake that has been offered to the kami. Drinking what the kami has been offered expresses gratitude for the safe completion of the ceremony. It's a very nice custom. So I've been noticing that most Miko shrine maidens are young women. Why is that? It's an ancient tradition that the Miko who serve the kami be young and pure. I think that's the main reason why most Miko are young. <laughs> Is there like an age limit or cutoff or something? Many Miko start when they graduate from high school. Typically, someone will work as a Miko until she is 25 or so. After that, she will go on to do something different in life. Personal appearance is important for Miko. They must have black hair, and their hair must be tied in a low ponytail. These rules apply to all shrine maidens. Is it difficult to maintain the hair and the clothing and stuff in this modern era? Well, I have to say that I feel a little envious sometimes when I see other students at university. But I'm proud to have this chance to work as a Miko, so I'm happy to stick with this appearance. Wow, you've changed. What's the occasion? I'll be performing a sacred dance. I thought you might like to see it. And so I had to change into this ceremonial outfit. So what is the meaning or the importance of Miko dancing at a shrine? We sometimes dance at festivals. Festivals are organized on behalf of the kami. Sometimes one Miko dances, and sometimes more than one. A dance is intended to please the kami. That is its significance. So the gods are a lot like us. They like to watch people dance. <laughs> yes. I think kami also like having fun. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Various different dances are performed as offerings to the kami. This one evokes a calm sea and expresses a prayer for tranquility in the world. The sound of the bells 
removes impurities and at the same time serves as an appeal to the kami to exercise divine power. Well, that was a rare opportunity to get a tour of a Shinto shrine. I even got to see a dance. Next time you're in Japan and you visit a Shinto shrine, spare a thought for the shrine maidens who keep things running so smoothly in front of and behind the scenes. Until then, see you next time. The year 1945 marked a watershed in the history of Shinto shrines. Before that, the government had administered all of Japan's shrines. But Japan's defeat in the Second World War led to the Allied occupation. It was decided that Shinto would be made completely independent of the Japanese state. Shrines were soon freed from government administration and made into autonomous religious institutions. This meant they could receive no subsidies from the government and had to generate their own sources of income. With the organizational changes after the Second World War, how has the role of um, both shrines and the priests changed? Shinto is something like a willow tree. It sways in the wind, but its roots remain fixed in place. So even though shrines were privatized, they continued to observe rituals according to unchanged tradition. Even as private institutions, they preserved the age-old Shinto customs. But it's a fact that making ends meet and keeping shrines running became really tough. Shrine priests had to preserve ancient styles while making the changes needed to adapt to a new era. But shrines have indeed adapted and evolved. I think this may still be happening. Mm. Under Japan's Religious Corporations Act, each shrine is its own religious entity. Mm. The state does not support or manage shrines. Shrines must find ways to support and manage themselves that are allowable by law. So head priests must be familiar with various aspects of the law. Things like civil law and constitutional law. And as employers, they must be familiar with labor regulations and hiring practices. Shrines have roots in and support from the local community. That's a key feature of shrines. The priest has to work out how each shrine is going to remain relevant to its local context what kind of place it should be. Through festivals and so on, the priest needs to get a sense of the local community network. Now, I was uh, quite surprised that you were required to be a legal expert as well. It's re really something I wasn't mm -hmm. expecting to hear. Of course, reverence for the kami is of paramount importance, but we have property to manage, buildings to maintain, if you don't know the law, you may not be able to deal with any issues that come up. Being credentialed as a shrine priest requires special studies at a designated educational institution. The curriculum covers the basics of rituals and history, as well as complex laws and regulations governing the running of a shrine as a religious corporation. Aspiring shrine priests and newly minted priests also undergo on-the-job training at large shrines like this to gain experience before going independent. What made you decide on this line of work? I grew up in a shrine family in Hokkaido. Watching my father carry out the duties of a shrine priest, making the offerings and so on. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. I have an older brother and I think he will take over the family shrine, but I don't mind if I work at some other shrine. I just want to serve the kami. 
so I'm aiming to be a Shinto priest. I grew up in a family with no connection to shrines. We had no connection with the work of priests either. But my family was serious about Shinto. We had a Shinto altar at home. My father would visit a local shrine every day. I'd see him doing that, and it made an impression on me. It influenced me to consider becoming a shrine priest. What kind of a role do you see for yourselves? I work at a shrine now. A lot of people know nothing about shrines, and it's not unusual for me to be mistaken for a Buddhist priest. But I hope to cultivate relationships with people in the community and become valued by them as a priest. Generally speaking, people seem to be less and less aware of that traditional culture. Is there a role there for your profession to play? A lot of people don't pay attention to what specific kami is enshrined where. It's probably fine if they have a general awareness that certain things are important. But I do think that people should know exactly when each ritual is supposed to be held. I want to share that knowledge. We must preserve traditional culture, otherwise we may lose Shinto and Shinto shrines as well. These days, people talk about a boom in the popularity of shrines or spirituality, but booms come and go. We need to do more grassroots work, building up people's appreciation of shrines in their communities through festivals and other activities. Shinto and shrines are part of Japanese tradition and culture, stretching back 2,000 years, carefully handed down over the generations. Unless we work to preserve an appreciation of that, it could all be forgotten. So looking ahead, the role of a shrine priest will become increasingly important in years to come. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Thank you very much. Next time on Japanology Plus, special rescue teams. We follow the people who respond first to emergencies and natural disasters.